I come from Line Selection Group. We're a Melbourne-based firm. Uh, we've been investing for around 26 years in the junior resources space, uh, and we invest to build companies that have projects that we think are worthy of becoming mines. Um, we've been doing this for a while. Uh, we're very, very mining technically oriented, uh, and we're cashed up and investing at the moment. So we're watching the market, and I'm sure you've all been hearing about uh, some of the difficulties in the, in the sector at the moment. Most of the CEOs who've been up on stage know what it's like to try and raise money in this market. Um, it's getting tougher for them. We've got $76 million of cash, and we're looking to deploy that carefully into a, uh, a diversified portfolio of, uh, of projects and companies within Australia over the next little while. So um, let me put a rock shot up there for you. Uh, always nice to emphasize the logo. This is an unusual rock which comes from quite a remote part of the Northern Territory. Uh, and the reason I put it up there is because it's currently causing quite a bit of excitement. If you haven't heard about it, that's because it's an unlisted company and I haven't told you too much about it. It's exciting me uh, because these textures tend to exist above deposits uh, which you know, occur elsewhere in the world. So it's an exploration story, sits within our portfolio and it's a recent investment um, that we're quite excited about. Before I go too much further, uh, always important to show the disclaimer and in this case, um, I always look at this slide and think, uh, sh shit, I wish I'd uh, shut the door of the car before I took the picture. Um, this, this, this is from the same place as that rock comes from, uh, but incidentally, that car, uh, if I'd left the door closed, you would have seen the rental company logo on the back door, um, and the paperwork, which I didn't examine until it was far too late, said no dirt roads and not out of Queensland. And this particular photo was taken when both of those were out of order. So. Uh, I, I can give you advice about uh, how to take pictures of cars in the desert. I can't give you advice about investment in this forum. So this talk is for purely educational purposes. Uh, and we're, we're going to go through some themes. Uh, so Kerry, Kerry usually gives quite strong direction in terms of what she wants uh, from speakers at the conference. And it's very difficult to say no. You, you often end up just saying yes to Kerry, no matter what the question is. Uh, so she said, can you come and do a talk? I said, yes, absolutely. What do you want me to talk on? She said, oh, I don't know, some gold equity themes. I thought, well, the other thing I know about Kerry is that she likes titles. So you can't just say Headley Widdop to talk about gold equity themes because it's not all that interesting really to think about. Uh, so instead of that, I needed a title. Um, and I thought what I'd go with is the tale of two commodities. Now, th these are themes in the gold equity market which we're going to explore. But it intersects another commodity, at least for a few of these themes. Uh, so I thought... Um, I, something caught my eye in a creative moment, and it was actually the, the, uh, the book um, The Tale of Two Cities uh, by Charles Dickens. And it, it actually is a contrast between Paris and London uh, at a period in time where there was an enormous difference between aristocracy and peasants. Uh, and it all sort of comes to a cataclysmic ending uh, and, and involves the French Revolution. So. I don't want to get that cataclysmic. Uh, it's just a good title, right? But um, there is, uh, I think, a difference that, that, it, that it, uh, occurs, particularly over the last six or seven years, between these two commodities, which is topical. Um, and the opening sentence, which is very long, right? So I'm just going to start it. Uh, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. I think that's a quote which a lot of people have heard. It goes on to say it was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness, etc. Charles Dickens used much longer sentences than you're permitted to do when you have a word processor. Uh, so th 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 this is a comparison of two commodities. Uh, and just taking this alternating view, which I think has probably been correct, if you were in these, you could have polar opposite experiences at any time in about the last five or six years. Let me get on and explain rather than just giving fucking context. Here we go. Okay, so tale of two commodities. What I'm talking about is uh, gold. So going back to 2017, this is the US dollar gold price. Uh, and I haven't put a scale on there because it's not that important. What I'm interested in is shapes. And here's lithium. Now, if you don't know about lithium, uh, you're at a gold conference, so I could probably excuse it, but you must have been hiding under something heavy because lithium has been making uh, a lot of headlines recently. And I wanted to compare this because when I look at this chart, I see very uh, distinctive um, periods. Uh, and, and I'm going to highlight them so you don't have to pick them out. 2017 is sort of where it all started. The reason I used 2017 for this chart is because lithium price data doesn't go back any further than that. So it's not a very easy comparison to do over a longer period of time. Um, in 2017, they both had a bit of a flurry. 2017 was early in a commodity cycle. So you know, it really wasn't uh, a, a period which does anything other than start this comparison. 
2018 through to 20, um, if you're in gold, then this was the spring of hope. Uh, and if you're in lithium, um, you know, there'd been a flurry. It was the winter of despair. Uh, I'm stretching that first sentence of Dickens's over several slides here, so forgive me if I do that a bit further. Um, but that was a two-year period where gold was incredibly strong. I mean, there was numerous macro drivers for this, but uh, this was leading up to uh, a period where inflation really did start to take hold. I won't say that that's because the gold market was so far looking, but we were experiencing a period of low to negative real interest rates, underpins the performance of gold in most markets, uh, so it, it allows it to go up. It doesn't necessarily dictate how far, but allows it to go up. 2021 uh, was when lithium was going directly to heaven. Uh, perhaps it was the epoch of belief. Uh, and for gold, uh, probably the epoch of incredulity. Um, I'm going to leave the Dickens quotes right there. Uh, so this was when, the interesting thing about this is that these are periods where the gold goes one way and lithium goes the other. Uh, and it's just, it has puzzled me that this has happened over uh, such a long period of time. I can understand it happening once, but what it has resulted in is money in the equity market, which is where most people are able to play the exposures to these things, moving from place to place. And it's introduced a new sector uh, on ASX um, as far as where institutional money can follow a new commodity. Um, so now this is interesting, early 2023, uh, I, I will talk a little bit about commodity leads and the effect that that has on equities. Um, we've seen the lithium price soften substantially. Now, this lithium chart is not on the same y-axis as the gold chart is. Uh, lithium went up something like seven or eight times in 2021. Gold um, hasn't even doubled. I think it's gone up about 35 or 40% in its major run on this chart. So lithium's sort of softening there uh, is, is a reasonable softening. This isn't the spodumene price, by the way. It's the lithium carbonate price. So they're two slightly different things. But I have never heard anyone, when lithium carbonate price was increasing, saying, but wait, it might not push the spodumene price up and discourage you from buying the equities. So the fact that it's softened, I think, is uh, just as valid to say, let's just be careful about that. And I, and I don't know what's next, but that's the question that it begs um, for these two commodities. All I can really say about that is that I think that uh, as one moves, the other will probably have to, uh, probably tend to have a little bit of an opposite tendency. What does this do for equities though? So I, I actually didn't know the answer to this. I just hoped that I'd be able to get some donuts that made a bit of sense. Um, so this donut chart shows you the capitalization of the ASX 200 resources index at the end of 2018, which was a turning point on that chart. It was just before gold ran. Um, gold took up about 10% of the market weight of that index at that point in time. Um, so th th there's your starting point. After this point, gold went up uh, in two years uh, around, actually I said 35% before, it was 66%. So in two years, gold goes up 66%. What happens to those equities in that market is actually very little as far as market weight is concerned. So gold went from being 10% of the index to 10% of the index. What also happened was lithium appeared in this big index. This is a big market cap index. So you know the, the appearance of lithium for the first time in that was substantial. Uh, lithium uh, price had moved by about 2% from uh, the, the start to the finish of this comparison period. The index has got bigger. That's why the donut is also bigger. So that's the nature of the comparison. You've had a big move then uh, from the end of 2020 to the end of 2022. Um, lithium's gone up 7.4 times in that time. And, and it's had an enormous effect on what is happening within the index. Um, lithium price has influenced some companies to become enormous producers, generate a hell of a lot of cash. And at that point, uh, lithium was taking up about 7% of the index. Now that's up from precisely zero uh, in four years. So it's, it's a huge growth of companies into this space. And what interests me about that is that whilst gold price performance in that period of time has been actually, you know, reasonably flat, um, golds have had their lunch eaten by the lithiums because gold no longer makes up 10% or 12% of that index. It makes up around 6%, which is less than what's accounted for by the, the lithium stocks in there. So, interesting. Let's delve into the equities a little bit more then. Um, what I'm showing you on the screen here is the two largest pure play gold producers on ASX on the left and the two largest pure play lithium producers on the right. Not really a fair comparison because the golds produce a, a final product, it's saleable. Uh, the lithiums produce carb, uh, lithium uh, spodumene concentrate, so they're not, 
they're not a finished product, but look, we're looking at equities, they're the two biggest in the space, and you can see the performance. I'm not actually trying to compare the grey lines for the performance and the returns on them. What I'm interested in is what the commodity uh, price leads look like over the top of those. Now, one of the topics which I've heard bandied around, particularly by some of the CEOs in the last couple of days, but you know, in months and months leading up to now, is gold price is running. The gold uh, producers in Australia haven't run nearly as hard. There's a little bit of a disconnect there. So I look at this chart and I say, well, just on shapes alone, the gold price is up, the gold equities actually aren't. You know, they haven't, they haven't collapsed, but they're, they're not up nearly as much as you would expect based on the gold price movement. The fascinating thing about it is that the lithiums are well up. The lithium carbonate price is not. And I mean, we've got a shape on that chart as the lithium producers were coming along, which suggests that lithium carbonate price goes up, uh, equity price goes up. Spodumene price arguably hasn't uh, returned quite so significantly as this, but spodumene price is a lot harder to measure. Lithium carbonate is a more finished product or at least a more uniform product. So uh, a, 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 an indexed price uh, is a bit easier to produce. So I worry about this a bit because now we have a sector which accounts for about 7%. It's eaten the gold's lunch and the equities are massively outperforming uh, the, the commodity. And I'm sure you're all familiar with the concept of reversion to the mean, right? Um, there's, a, there's a concept in mining investment which is ignored by most of the equity market, particularly when sentiment is running hot, which is reversion to the commodity lead. It's not happening in lithium and it's over-exaggerated in gold. So there's an interesting gold concept for you. Um, I'm going to move away from the, uh, the lithium concept for a moment. Uh, and I thought I'd look at what is going on inside of the gold producing space in Australia. So I've, I've sort of narrowed in on A dollar pricing and, uh, and, and Australian producers here. That's the A dollar price going back to the start of 2018. And overlaying on that, the Australian gold index. So you can see a gap emerging and the question is, why is that gap there? Why doesn't the gold index follow the gold price a little bit more closely? So what I wanted to look at was cash flows within the sector. So I've overlaid some bar charts there and if I just change the labels around, those are the aggregated cash flows, operating cash flows of the Australian focused gold producers in that index. And it's, it's the same group of co companies going back. So there's no adding and subtracting companies to affect those. Uh, and you can see when the gold price goes up, uh, operating cash flows go up because that's revenue minus costs. This is not the sole way to explain this though. And uh, it's important to look at how much of that cash becomes free cash because there's an explanation of performance in this. So if we add investing cash flows to that as well, I think if you eyeball this, I don't need to tell you what the answer is. Uh, there's as much, if not more, investing cash flows going out the door as there is notionally free cash uh, generated by that index of gold producers. So I think here is the start of the, of the answer to the question of why are gold producers underperforming the Australian dollar gold price move. There are many, many other factors, I can assure you. Uh, and when a lot of foreign money priced in US dollars is coming into the market, th they are affected to US dollar gold price uh, factors and sentiment just as much as, uh, so that's important. But in this case, I just wanted to point out, this is an equity theme. Um, the equities actually, as a whole, aren't collecting a great deal of free cash. Um, Jake spoke about this, uh, and the, the, the example he didn't use uh, was to <laughs> ask who in the room has teenage children, because this is the best way to explain this, right? Um, I have teenage children, and I don't know if any of you who do have teenage children have experimented by increasing the amount of money you give them just to see if it, <laughs> it influences how much of it they actually save. Uh, I think gold producers are largely the same, right? So more money comes in, they spend more money. Uh, I know it's a bit of a cruel analogy, but uh, I think it holds true. So. I suppose one way to explain that, um, that, that the answer to that question is uh, hidden in the cash flows there. I haven't produced this uh, as a comparison for the lithiums. Uh, looking quickly at their cash flows, uh, they were investing desperately in getting into business in, in the early part of this chart, and they've been harvesting massive amounts of cash uh, in the latter part of it, which probably explains why the equities have performed so strongly despite the commodity lead there. Um, and that probably explains why there might be a lag if you were to expect some sort of revert to the commodity lead, uh, which I was alluding to before. All right, moving on. Something which also affects sentiment dramatically uh, within the equity space for golds 
is whether or not there's been a good experience versus a bad experience of what happens when capital is deployed. So what I'm showing you across the middle of this page is the Australian Gold Index, and I'll keep coming back to this. Um, and that's my baseline. So what I'm interested in is the grey wiggles which I put on this chart are above or below, um, and that's telling me good or bad experience, right? So they all start from where the index was at that point, and I'm seeing whether or not the equity stories which I add to it have outperformed or underperformed the index. Uh, the first two, I'm not going to name names because I don't want to embarrass anyone. Uh, and, and in one case, one of these companies has been renamed uh, from a company that starts with G and now starts with S. So like I said, I don't want to identify anyone. Different management team, future is different. But the, the historical aspect of this, starting in about 2018, there was two gold developments that were kicked off in Western Australia, which were, I think you could say, resource disasters. The engineering, I think, was probably pretty good, but the geology which underpinned the projects wasn't as good as was expected, didn't produce the cash flows, and in this case you can see, I mean, it was almost total capital destruction. And this overweighs the sentiment for investors in the space quite heavily, because if there has been a company verging on entering the index or has taken debt from bankers, it affects the pool of money which is available for the next time around. Uh, so anyway, they, they, are, they are arguably horror stories. If you add the gold developers which have uh, taken place 2019, 2020, 2021, uh, again, not naming names, um, every single one of those has underperformed the index. One of them is moving up towards it. Um, and you know, this kind of compounds this feeling that if you put money into a company to build a new gold mine, you have a negative experience. I, I don't think that's a fair comparison, but these are the examples which are available right at the minute, and they definitely impinge on sentiment within the space. Uh, it impinges on money that's not even in the equity space. It's money which is leveraging the equities like debt. So that's important to think about. But you can't do this comparison without adding a couple more. Um, there's been one gold development, uh, Capricorn, uh, which developed a, a project called Carlowinda, which has massively outperformed. So there are multiples uh, of performance there. There are people factors. There are all kinds of factors which contribute to that. But at the end of the day, um, I think this is a sentiment which unfairly overprints the sector because there's not too many people who go around going, we should invest in gold equities because Capricorn was such a marvellous bloody story. I think it's more common that investors go around saying, we don't want to invest in gold equities because of X, Y, Z, which were failures uh, or have underperformed the market. So I think that hangs over it, particularly at the moment. And that's not to say that uh, lithium developments have been massively successful in terms of the deployment on cost and budget. Um, some of them haven't, but they've been protected by a really strong uh, revenue line, which, which has provided their performance. Okay, I, I think this is not the first time I've used this chart, and I don't like using charts twice. Uh, but I've updated it because I think the first time I used it, um, I became aware that quite a few people had, had, had parroted it, and very kind of them to acknowledge that. Uh, that's not the point. The point is it must have struck a chord, so I thought I should update this. Um, so this is a chart which starts at the bottom of the COVID crash. So March 2020, this chart starts. And it shows the performance of the Australian Gold Index once again. Um, fantastic performance through most of the rest of 2020. A bit of a downward story through 21 and 22. Uh, and then somewhat of a recovery. Now, not a massive outperformance, but uh, as I was talking about before, but a, a positive performance. So the gold miners have come into a bit of clover because their revenue lines have been bolstered by a boosted A dollar gold price. So good for them. Um, normally, what would you expect of the explorers? Well, if they're exposed to gold, perhaps they should share in that sentiment. In this case, the explorers seem to have fallen right out of bed. They've, they've experienced the same uplift. This is not the same y-axis. They went up by slightly different amounts, but I wanted to overlay the shape so that you could see what the sentiment was. So they've gone up, and then they shared in the negative experience of 21 and 22, and come 2023, that negative experience has just kept on going. Uh, and the easiest explanation for this is that as inflation has started to impinge the equity market, uh, the money tap has been switched off. So uh, if you need to raise money in order to keep your activities going, that money has been switched off your share price starts to get affected by your inability to raise as much money as you need, and probably because a lot of the people who are looking to reinvest in the sector need to get that money from the sector by selling shares somewhere. So it has a negative feedback. And I think that's what plays out here. It's true across most other commodities uh, at the moment, but it's particularly stark in gold. 
So another theme which uh, is, is worth thinking about, and I, this one is on my mind a lot uh, at the moment, is, uh, and, and it get commentated around, I mean, I don't think I've had a day at this conference or diggers and dealers, in fact, probably could say I haven't had an hour at any of the last three or four conferences I've gone to where gold consolidation hasn't been discussed in a discussion that I've been in or listening to. Um, so there, there are parts of Western Australia which are famous gold producing districts and in some cases, many cases in fact, they are infrastructure dense. So there are, there are lots and lots of gold production facilities that can take the ore and, and separate the gold. It's not to say that they're not full, um, but the gold sector, particularly in Western Australia, is also characterised by a lot of old mines which do have diminishing reserves. So if this is a concept uh, you know, that, that might be of varying relevance today. There's a mill, it's full, therefore it's not a problem they don't need to consolidate. You've also got to think about the next two, sort of two, three, four, five years. And I think that's on the minds of a lot of the major companies which operate many of those mills. Um, we've seen some of them here today. I mean, Evolution uh, and uh, West, uh, West Gold are both operating in these regions where there are plenty of gold facilities uh, and scattered resources. And I think both of those um, MDs uh, or chairman have commented on the lack of, uh, of central ownership in the gold uh, sector. So that, that calls for consolidation, if you like. Now, that's not to say that I think it should happen, but I know there are a lot of people in the equity market who are investing because they think there's a consolidation theme. And that doesn't mean you go buy the buyer, it means you go buy the seller, you know, the, the company which is going to have a target on it. So. I thought, well, it, what better way to illustrate this than just have pictures of a big fish and a little fish. So I apologise, I could have put some ASX codes on there or, you know, people's faces. I think if it was Peter Cook presenting, he probably would have uh, put people's identities on there. But um, this applies to so many companies. Uh, I think there is going to be, because it is, it is cheaper and less risky for the owners of process plants to purchase existing resources than it is to go and try and define new ones of their own. This will be a theme, particularly in gold, I would say for three, four, five years to come. Uh, it's definitely one to keep watching. I want to stray outside of gold uh, for a second, and this is kind of, I'm, I'm towards the home straight now. Um, I want to stray outside of gold just for a second because um, to answer the question of what's the outlook for gold equities, and I, I don't necessarily want to give you an answer to that, I just want to give you some thoughts. Um, to answer that question though, what's, what's approaching for gold equities, um, you sort of also need to be answering the question, what's in store for the outlook of, of mining companies? Um, mining companies respond very much to a, to a commodity lead. So what I've got here is the longest term commodity price chart uh, that I can find in under five seconds. I have a very low attention span when it comes to acquiring data. So this is just copper price, uh, monthly close, straight out of iris. Um, so we've got 50 plus years of, of copper price on him. I think there's a couple of interesting things that jump out of this, but you're gonna need the eye of faith, so I need to uh, annotate it briefly for you. Um, there's, there's a number of mining boom cycles which are illustrated on this chart, and you can see them. The interesting thing that I find about them is that from boom to boom, it is not uncommon to see copper topping out at a reasonably similar price. Now, it might be above or below, um, but you know, if copper goes to, I'd pick a price, four bucks fifty a pound, um, to see it hit that level again two or three years later, um, and then ten years later, it doesn't surprise me that much. Something like copper has a value in use, it has a cost to people that need to put it into their finished product, and there comes a time where it just becomes too expensive. It could be substituted, wind down stockpiles, you pick your poison. But uh, one way or another, um, what I see in this chart is from cycle to cycle that there is a, a roof uh, in some commodities, particularly these ones which are consumed. And the reason why I put that up there is because you need to think about this when you're thinking about the commodity lead which is given to mining companies. Um, the fundamentals for this particular commodity, copper, are absolutely outstanding. I mean, you get any number of commentators stand up here and say, every 25 years, we double copper demand. In the last 50 years, we've used more copper than was consumed in the history of humanity before that. Those are both facts, but it's also a fact, in my mind at least, that trend tends to trump fundamentals every single time when it comes to which way commodity prices are going. And there is one economy, a uh, large economy, 
um, in our neck of the woods, which is not shooting the lights out at the moment. Uh, the biggest consumer of commodities in the world, which emerged in the last two decades, is China. Uh, and I think this is feeding through very strongly into commodity prices now. The firmness has come right out of it, and I think it makes it very difficult to read the outlook. Now, does that mean that I don't think that copper won't break through these levels? Well, when China came into the market in circa the year 2000, it took that roof from one level to another level, which was materially higher. So I think the electrification theme uh, has the capacity to do that, but I don't expect it to happen tomorrow. I don't expect it to happen in the next 12 months, and I certainly don't expect that to happen in probably the next two to five years. I think that's something which could play out over a decade at the very least. And if you think, well, okay, that's just copper, right? Um, there is an exceptionally strong correlation between commodities over the cycle of decades. So I think this also impinges to some extent on what goals, goes on in the gold price. We will talk on the panel later about what caused the gold price to go up so strongly between circa 98 and 2011 or whatever it was. Um, it just interests me that that happened to copper at the same time. And that wasn't because gold companies were hedging or de-hedging. Uh, copper was not influenced by that. So there is a lot of commonality uh, in the global economy which, which drives this, and that drives mining equities. So if it's what next for gold uh, equities, well, I think there's, there's probably a learning from that, which is there's, there's a commodity lead. Uh, gold is capable of leaving that copper trend for periods of time, up to a year or two, um, and I think that's definitely a valid thing to say. But long term, will one lead the other higher? Well, I think they both need to move, and probably for similar underpinning reasons. Uh, so, finishing up my conclusions, um, I just wanted to pull out a couple of high-level themes, uh, and it, what this boils down to is liquidity. Often talk about the lion clock, um, and this would be the slide where I would put that up. I'm not going to show it today, and the reason I'm not is because in 2021-22, we, we put that at midnight. Uh, we'd reached the top of the mining cycle and we're coming down the other side, so it's somewhere between midnight and three o'clock. But I actually don't have a really strong view on exactly what time that is, so I don't want to put a clock up there because what happens is that you know, certain media outlets go, oh, clock is at a certain time. I actually can't tell you with a great deal of confidence what that is, which means we're still coming down with the liquidity having come out of the market. That, that money tap has been turned off. But what I can tell you is uh, inflation's a thing. We didn't believe it to start with, but it's here. How long will it last? I don't know, but it's definitely impinging equities. Um, I think that led to risk averseness generally. Um, the, the, the competition now in the equity market is 5% per annum uh, returns on term deposits and, and bond yields. So, you know, equities have to work a lot harder to, uh, to exceed that benchmark now. It's felt the hardest by micro caps. Most of the companies at this conference are micro caps. So it has a consequence for, for, uh, for fundraising. And this, it makes it extremely challenging uh, for developing resources companies to access that capital that they need in order to go on. If you're Jake Klein at Evolution, you have operating cash flows. And I don't think they have invested over what they've taken out of the ground uh, in their history. There's plenty of other companies which have gone over that. So, you know, Evolution's one of those ones which has been able to harvest cash flows to some extent. Um, but explorers can't. They don't have cash flow. They need to raise it. For gold equities, well, it lacks a sentimental attraction. Gold is oscillating. It's going up in Aussie dollar terms, but this is not enough to shake the risk averseness of investors who don't want to put fresh money into companies to explore to maybe discover something. Um, rather, I think, you know, you need a gold price move of doubling or trebling uh, in order to break that malaise. Uh, will that happen? Don't know. But uh, that, that's the kind of fundamental that I would see could rescue the gold explorers in that context. They're definitely feeling the lack of liquidity the strongest because they don't have this pull of uh, the world is going to electrify and need more lithium than you can dream of. Um, and the gold industry is consolidating. So that's a bit of a flip side to that coin because there is upside for juniors there. Just need to be very careful about what it is that you're looking at inside those companies. For the junior resources market, uh, I think, well, and this is a bit of an advertisement for Lion, but... Um, it is the most contrarian asset class which there is around at the moment. It's, it's underfunded, uh, the commodity lead is absent, and share prices are falling. That's not typically a market which investors wade into. But in the last 12 months, the company that I work for with circa $76 million worth of cash, we can buy twice as much for that cash now than what we could 12 months ago. So that purchasing power of liquidity has doubled in circa that time. Um, the, the opportunity that's presented here for investors as well is not... There is not a finite, this has come down, the whole sector is screwed. That has never, ever been the case. 
Mining cycles are definite. You just don't know the extent of them and, and exactly when the turning points are. But I can tell you with absolute confidence, there is going to be another boom. And that will be followed by a bust and so on and so forth. Um, so, you know, buying now for a fund like Lion uh, is justified on the basis that we're seeing things getting cheaper and we know that that will turn around at some stage. We just don't know when it is. So the long-term outlook, I think, is bright. Cyclicity is what I've just been explaining, uh, and the long-term commodity uh, outlook is great. Just need those commodities to get the stronger uh, lead for the equity market to turn around. And look, uh, this is a quote which pertains very much to Lion. It's not an encouragement to you. If you see it as that way, well, do your research for first. But periods of extreme volatility, such as what we're in at the moment, have historically uh, provided some of the most lucrative investment opportunities that our firm has ever been able to take advantage of. And that is exactly what's guiding our mentality at the moment. I'll just leave you with three letters uh, to think about. This is an ASX code. It's an unashamed plug. Uh, like I said, we're well funded. So just if you're going to jot anything down in your, in your little clever books, uh, L, S, and X in that order, <laughs> um, plug it in, have a look. Uh, we're an investor in Australia. Our major asset at the moment is cash. The purchasing power of that is multiplying. We're looking across the sector to develop a portfolio which is diversified across 10 to 15 exposures. It'll be involved in several commodities uh, and we're looking for cents in the dollar and sensible uh, investment into things that are going to be projects into the future.